Good afternoon. My name is Peter Sirota, and uh, I'm the general manager of Amazon Elastic MapReduce service. Um, before we uh, start our presentation, which is scaling your analytics with uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce, I want to take a quick poll. Can you please raise your hand if you've used uh, Hadoop before? So a lot of hands, like 60% of the room. Can you raise your hand if you've used Elastic MapReduce before? Huh, maybe half of you. That's a uh, Pretty exciting. So uh, maybe some of that is going to be a uh, repeat of the information you already know, but maybe not. So what we're going to talk today about, we're going to talk about some of the Amazon Elastic MapReduce features and how we help Hadoop uh, customers take full advantage of the AWS Web Services, Amazon Web Services um, that want to use Hadoop. We'll talk a little bit about Hadoop ecosystem on Amazon EMR. And then we'll have two of our customers presenting their use cases and their infrastructure and, and their um, architecture and how they use EMR to accomplish their big data analytics. Just to recap slide, is Hadoop the right system for big data processing? Um, some of our customers are asking us, well, look, now you have Redshift and you have other technologies. Why, <clears throat> is, why Hadoop and uh, what, is it, what does it do for, for, uh, for the data processing? And so, you know, there's really several, several reasons why we believe that Hadoop is an excellent general purpose uh, data processing tool. First of all, the application itself, Apache Hadoop, is scalable and fault tolerant so that you can add more machines to process more data. You can distribute the data across multiple machines and process it effectively. It's fault tolerant in the sense that if you have a machine that goes out of service, Hadoop can, Hadoop can continue processing the data. It's a very flexible system in the sense that you can have multiple languages that you can use to process big data. For example, you can have um, a Java program that you can write to process data in Hadoop, or you can have a SQL statement, or you can have a, uh, an R package or R program that you'd use. So variety of data, variety of languages and a variety of data formats, from semi-structured log files to completely non-structured binary data formats. Hadoop is open source, which Obviously, you know, makes sense, which, which makes it easier for you to, 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 um, to stay vendor neutral and not have lock ins. But another uh, aspect of the open source community is that it's a really vibrant ecosystem. There's a ton going on with Hadoop. A lot of interesting technologies are coming up literally every couple of months. And so we'll talk about some of them later. Hadoop has built, there's a vibrant ecosystem of vendors that provide paid for services and software that makes your life easy to build applications or to troubleshoot your applications and provide security features, encryption features, things like that. Hadoop traditionally started as a batch-oriented system. So essentially, you have batch programs that, write, that, that run periodically. However, what's happening as of late is Hadoop is moving into real-time processing, meaning that customers that run Hadoop queries, they want results faster. And as a result, there's several technologies that now have become available in Hadoop that makes it easier. There are challenges with Hadoop. If you use Hadoop on premise, you have to figure out how to manage your HDFS, which is Hadoop Distributed File System, how to make the disaster recovery work, uh, story work. You have to figure out how to manage your upgrades. There's a significant system administration. If your node doesn't work, you have to replace it. So all that complexity comes with, uh, with Hadoop on premise. Also, you have to pay for expensive support contracts if you want support. Um, now, one of the more important reasons why Hadoop on-premise is so inflexible is that you have to figure out in advance what hardware do you want and then stick with that hardware. What happens is that, in fact, Hadoop jobs are very diverse. And so, you know, some Hadoop jobs are memory intensive, some CPU intensive. And so um, picking the hardware up front sometimes could be a wrong choice. You can also run Hadoop on EC2 directly. Um, however, if you do that, there's still some difficulties. You have to figure out how to integrate with AWS storage services. You have to still independently manage and monitor Hadoop clusters, replace hardware, et cetera. So we really believe that Amazon EMR is sort of the easiest and the best way to run Hadoop in the cloud. So why use EMR? What sort of interesting features do we see our customers using uh, on EMR? First of all, it's a fully managed service, right? So you can issue an API command or uh, through, com or through command line client or console, you can launch a Hadoop job, Hadoop cluster. Now, once the cluster is set up and running, you can actually, um, uh, we manage that cluster while it's in progress. So for instance, if you have a, 
a problem with the disk um, or a problem with the faulty hardware, that hardware gets replaced automatically behind the scenes so you don't have to even worry about it. We provide various tuning mechanisms uh, for, clusters, for, for clusters, and we enable you to use the variety of pricing payment options that make you uh, trim your costs. We support multiple data stores, and we'll talk more about that in detail. But, so, but um, you know, your data originates in multiple places, and we believe that you should be able to use one system to access the data no matter where it resides, and Hadoop is a great choice for that. And we have some interesting, unique features in, in ecosystem support that makes really um, nice package solution. So let's start with the sort of basic, uh, basic idea of uh, how do you use uh, Amazon EMR. So you have variety of different data stores. So, so, so you probably have the data already in S3. You probably have data in DynamoDB or Redshift. You might be generating data on application servers, and then you need to push the data somewhere. And typically, you input that data into some of those services. Then when you write your code, your application, it can be you know, in R or a SQL statement or whatever the application you write. And then you launch a Hadoop cluster. So you essentially issue an API command to Elastic Mapper and say, launch a cluster. And so what Elastic Mapreduce would do in the end, it'll actually take the, it'll provision the, the name node, then it'll provision the slaves for the cluster, it'll install software on it. You actually can configure Hadoop um, and tune Hadoop on the EMR. So we have this concept called bootstrap action that allows you to essentially run arbitrary piece of code in your cluster before, the cl before a node is checked in into the cluster. So for example, you can tune the parameters, you can install additional software, uh, you can, you pretty much, you know, you have root access to that, to that cluster, and the bootstrap actions are used widely by, <coughs> you know, for tuning, for installing of software, et cetera. Once your cluster is running, you have direct access to that cluster through the APIs, but also through, um, um, so directly accessing um, Hadoop. So you can have uh, BI tools, for example, directly interfacing with Hadoop over JDBC or ODBC drivers. You can submit pig or hive interactive queries. And then you have a choice to optionally output your data in some other, thir other third-party system. So for example, you can keep the data on HDFS in a continuously running Hadoop, but you can choose to output the data back into S3 or into DynamoDB or some other uh, system. And if you do that, you can essentially kill your cluster and you can scale data separately from CPU. So essentially you can have all your data, petabytes of data, stored in S3, and then you can have multiple clusters that run against that same data set um, that are in the EMR. So the clusters are elastic. You can customize the clusters, and you can reduce the cost. And so, so how some of our customers do that? So first, you can choose your instance types, and you can, and you can uh, to some degree, mix and match instance types. So if you want to run always on Hadoop cluster and store all of your data on HDFS, just like many on-premise systems, we have a great node for that, which is a HS1, 8x or large. It has 48 terabytes of memory, or 48 terabytes of disk uh, against 24, uh, 24 uh, disks, uh, which delivers about 3 gigabytes per second to the CPU. And uh, it, it has a 10 gigabit interconnect. So that is a system that you know, a lot of our customers choose to go with if they want to have fully sort of HDFS always on cluster. Now, if you decide to use more of an S3 approach where you store a lot of your data in S3 and you scan S3 with your uh, EMR processing, you might want to go with uh, some of the other instance types where you know, the, uh, the disk is not as important as uh, I.O. or memory. And so we have mem memory intensive instances and we have CPU intensive instances. Um, and so you know, depending on your workload, you might choose to, um, to go with either M1 uh, or M2 families uh, or the CPU uh, intensive, so C1, Excel. Or, or CC2 um, families. So now, for example, we have customers that do um, image recognition on top of uh, Elastic MapReduce, and those guys use uh, something like CC2. And then we have customers that are doing log scan, pro log processing in ETL. A great instance for that is M1XL. So you can tune, and, and by the way, you don't have to have a single cluster and that's it. You can have clusters that you can create for different job types, so you optimize for the jobs um, that, that, that you have running. The other sort of access pattern is essentially you need to make a decision 
whether you want to run the transient clusters, so you essentially uh, have a batch job that runs every day or every couple hours, so you just essentially spin a cluster up, and then once it's done, you uh, persist it back in S3 and you shut it down. Or you can run 24 by 7 clusters where the load is predictable and you have, um, uh, you know, and it's continuous. In reality, many of our customers choose both of those options. So they will take the, the um, um, always on use case where they continue to run some ETL processes, for example, and they'd run an always on cluster, and then they would um, use the transient clusters for some one off jobs, for example. The other aspect, you don't, you, know, you don't have to just choose one cluster size and stick with it. Elastic Mapper is enables you to resize the cluster while it's running. So, for example, if you have a job that takes 10 hours to run um, on four nodes, you can halfway through that job decide to increase the cluster by doubling it, for example, and so it will run faster. One other aspect of this is that, you know, in practice, a lot of our customers, they, they have clusters that run during the day, you know, maybe for query processing, but then at night, they'll run complex CTLs, uh, which the size of the cluster had to increase for that complex CTL processing. So they would expand the cluster during the night, and then they shrink it during the day. So you can manage the capacity. You can match compute demands with the cluster sizing. Now, the other interesting aspect is you can use Elastic MapReduce with all of the available pricing that is available in Institute, and specifically Spot and RI are very effective for um, sort of your operational uh, cluster setup. So let's talk about Spot. So Elastic MapReduce split the Hadoop nodes into two categories. There's a task node and there's a core node. The task nodes are the ones that run the jobs, but they don't hold any data on them. Uh, they don't hold HDFS on them, and the core nodes they do the data processing, but they also hold the data, so they hold the HDFS. So typically, customers run clusters with the data, with the HDFS on them, with on-demand, so they have clusters that are running on-demand instances, and then they would augment the cluster with Spot. What's interesting about Spot is, is it's about 90% um, off EC2 price. It's very, very inexpensive, but the opposite part of it is that, is that sometimes these nodes go away and they have to be reclaimed by the service. So EMR manages all that complexity. You just have to say how many machines you want in a spot and how many and how much you're willing to pay for it. it EMR will regulate that number based on uh, whether or not the spot service has the capacity. And of course, if you have a predictable load and you know what instance types you want in a number of those instances, you can greatly reduce your cost by subscribing to reserved instances, which is about 65% off of the on-demand pricing. So you can use a spot, you can use RIs, and you can use on-demand, all in the context of um, the same cluster. One other interesting pass, uh, fact about the task and core nodes, you can mix and match different instance types. So for example, you can run the core nodes with the HS1 and then augment the task nodes with you know, C1 family, for example. Now Amazon, as I mentioned, Elastic MapReduce integrates with multiple data stores. And we believe that it's really important to not just provide HDFS access, which we obviously provide, but provide access to all of the other stores that you might use already for your data needs. So you very likely use S3 to store your logs or images or any other information you might want to uh, you know, crunch with, uh, with uh, Amazon EMR. You're likely using HDFS. There's other access points like DynamoDB and the Redshift and Amazon Glacier and the relational database services, all of which has reliable connectors to um, EMR and access through the applications that you write. So for instance, you can write a Hive script that, uses, that, that queries the data in S3, queries the data in DynamoDB, um, and frankly, HDFS in one single SQL statement. So most of the time, people end up doing some hybrid architectures where you have multiple data stores using in the same cluster. So for instance, you might have some data stored in S3, and then you might have transient clusters running against that data store, but you also might want to run the, the always-on cluster against that same uh, bucket that you have and periodically sync to the bucket so you have HDFS and S3 access pattern. So the reason why it's really a good approach is because S3 provides 11 nines durability. It's a very durable store. You also can, um, can prevent your customers from shooting themselves in the foot using S3. So for example, some of our customers complain to us, hey, look, you know, I accidentally deleted data off of HDFS. Can we help restore with that? You know, it's a really hard problem, 
Uh, and uh, on-premise, typically customers deal with that by doing backups or replications off of HDFS cluster someplace else. Well, if you, ha if you use S3, you can enable versioning on your S3 bucket, and so none of the deletes will actually happen. It'll just increment the version of the files. And then you can set up life policy on top of those files so that you know, versions with, you know, old versions could expire in 90 days, or you can archive them to Glacier in 90 days. So you have this really great disaster recovery story with S3. The other benefit is you can run multiple clusters against the same data store. You can partition S3 data using permissions um, and ACLs so that some departments, for example, don't go uh, and look at the data of the other departments if you have a, an enterprise company. The other pattern that we see used a lot is Amazon EMR in conjunction with Redshift. When Redshift came out, folks were saying, well, you know, is Redshift a replacement for EMR? Are there competitive technologies? They really, in reality, are highly complementary technologies. Um, EMR is a one use case, is a big ETL into Redshift. So for example, if you have log files, you need to scrub them before you load them into Redshift. EMR is used a lot for that. If you use user-defined functions, for example, you can actually grab data from Redshift and run those user-defined functions inside EMR and join some other data sets. You can run R programs on top of um, Redshift data, for example, by exporting data from Redshift into EMR. And there's a really fast interconnect that we recently launched that enable, enables you to load data from EMR HDFS directly into Redshift. So Amazon Elastic MapReduce provides you know, a significant vibrant ecosystem on top, of, uh, on top of just standard Hadoop. We recently launched Hadoop 2.0, or actually Hadoop 2.2, which is a GA version of Hadoop second generation. Uh, it has a, an interesting framework called Yarn that allows you to launch non-MapReduce applications inside Hadoop, which will unleash all sorts of use cases. Now, but that, that, um, that version comes with a lot of other interesting goodies. So obviously it has MapReduce and Avro support and Thrift support, Mahout, which is a statistical library, um, machine, lear machine learning. There's databases that come with Hadoop, which is age-based, we'll talk a little bit about in a second. Um, there's diverse query languages such as Pig and Hive. So there are a lot of open source tools that are being built. So let's review you know, one of them, which is uh, Hive, right? So Hive is a SQL-like component that allows you to write SQL against EMR, right? So you can run a query in Hive uh, against your EMR cluster. So you can build a sort of a data warehouse on top of Hadoop. We integrated Hive with S3 and with DynamoDB. So you actually can, as I mentioned earlier, but I want to repeat it because it's a really quite uh, interesting uh, feature. You can run Hive query that joins tables across all of the data sources that I mentioned. So for example, if you have a table in DynamoDB that has customer clicks, and you have table in HDFS that has customer account information, and you have table in S3 that might have some order information, you can write a single statement in Hive that will join all those three, all those three storages, all those three tables together. And it uses fast interconnect that we've built that utilizes the full power of your capacity in Dynamo, for example, for reads. Well, full, cap full capacity or however much you, you want to allocate for that query because it's a flexible query. You can actually say, look, I want to use only 5% of my available Dynamo capacity. But it'll use the capacity very efficiently to do that, um, to do that integration. So it's a really powerful feature if you have multiple, if you have data in multiple form, in multiple stores. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of our customers are pushing us and, and the Hadoop ecosystem to drive faster and faster into um, uh, sort of near real-time um, uh, operations. So they want their queries to return faster, um, at least in some data sets. And so Amazon, um, well, EMR essentially has an integration with HBase, which is a NoSQL database, columnary, uh, columnary database, which allows you, you know, to store billions of rows uh, across millions of columns. It's really good at uh, range queries, for example, uh, and uh, it's fully integrated with the EMR. One interesting feature we've built in that, so in that solution is we actually have a backup and restore from Dynamo into, from uh, HBase into S3. So you can have scheduled backup mechanism that automatically backs up your data into S3, and then you can recover from that backup um, on another availability zone, um, or in case of disaster recovery, just restart that, uh, that cluster. Another... Um, 
solution that is available now in the market and, and is available in the Amazon EMR is a Spark and Shark, which is in-memory map reduced for faster queries. So Shark is essentially uh, a SQL-like language that uh, Hive, Hive ql like language that enables you to uh, run SQL queries on the data that is in memory. So for example, you can have a you can spin up an EMR cluster, load data from HDFS into a Spark memory database, and then you can have queries running really, really fast. Uh, Berkeley actually did a, a benchmark test against uh, Spark, Impala, DynamoDB, and um, some uh, and some other uh, systems. And actually, there's a um, you know there's a good write-up. You guys can look it up. Today we're pronouncing that we're actually going to launch Impala, which is another um, database product on top of EMR. So the Impala product will allow you to run parallel database queries on top of Hadoop. Again, you can use a SQL interface and uh, query data in HDFS on your cluster. This, this morning, Werner announced a streaming, ser streaming service which allows you to store stream data or stream data into the cloud, which is called Amazon Kinesis. Um, so Elastic MapReduce will provide a connector into that service. So you'll be able to use Hive, Pig, and MapReduce jobs. So all of the infrastructure that you already have with EMR against that data store as well. So you can build, for example, things like micro-batching, where you can have, you know, um, if you have uh, logs arriving to uh, Kinesis, uh, um, say, you know, continuously, every five minutes, you can have a MapReduce job that would run, grab those logs, do some aggregation and push the results uh, into your Dynamo table, for example, or, or someplace else. So you know, this is a, you know, a really exciting um, uh, connector that will help you build additional use cases on top of EMR. So to, to wrap things up, we have um, you know, Elastic Mapper really helps you uh, operate Hadoop clusters in the cloud. So it provides elastic clusters and enables you to optimize your costs to save money on data processing. It has rapid tuned-in provisioning of clusters, so you can launch as many as you need for your applications. Um, and it integrates with a lot of data stores in AWS, which makes it really easy to experiment and to build innovative data, innovative, uh, data products. So we have you know, um, significant n number of partners that, um, that build on top of Elastic Mapper. So you know, we have BI tools from uh, the top vendors like MicroStrategy and SAP and JaspSoft and Tableau. Uh, we have alternative distributions in EMR because we believe that there should be a choice. And if you want to be able to run MapR on top of EMR, you shouldn't sacrifice all the features that, um, that EMR provides. So we actually work with these vendors to make sure that distributions are available. We have thousands of customers that use EMR today. And, uh, We'll have a couple of uh, customers present right now on their use case and how they're using EMR. So first, I'd like to introduce, uh, introduce uh, Eva Tse, who is the director of Big Data Platform and Netflix. And she's going to talk about how they're using EMR and Netflix. Hi, everybody. My name is Eva Tse, and I manage the data, Big Data Platform team at Netflix. So at Netflix, we have one unified Hadoop-based data analytics platform that is shared by the whole company. And we build it on top of EMR. And today, I'm going to walk through some of the key decisions that we make and things that we do to make it scalable for our use cases. So before I do that, I'm just going to give a very short um, history of why we're in the cloud. So in 2008, um, we have a database corruption in our data center that disrupt DVD deliveries for our customer for a few days. So that clearly indicates that we need a more fault-tolerant system. And in 2009, our streaming service is expanding rapidly, and we are also planning for global expansion. So we want to have a globally scalable system. Going to the cloud is the logical next step, and AWS is the most mature cloud infrastructure that we pick. And it's worthwhile to mention that because we're moving all the Netflix services to the cloud, it is only logical for us to build our data analytics platform in the cloud also where the data is being generated. So how do we exactly achieve the scalability that we need? 
When I mention scalability, I don't only mean infrastructure scalability, I also mean how do we scale our team better. So if there is one single most important key architectural choice that we make is this one. We decided to separate compute and storage layer. Specifically, we decided that S3 is our data warehouse, it is our source of truth, and that's where we store all our data. If we choose HDFS as our storage layer, we will need to do a lot more work to replicate the clusters and to make, keep them in sync. So we decided to use S3 directly, which is highly available, scalable, and 11.9 durable. And we only use HDFS as temporary storage when we spin off Hive and pick jobs that spin up multiple Hadoop jobs. So how does S3 throughput compare to HDFS? That's usually a, a question that we always get. Um, at Netflix, we're using sequence file right now. So with that file format, when we benchmark read throughput, S3 is about five to 10% slower than HDFS. But given our nature of having long running job and multi-state jobs, that's not really significant. And for write throughput, at times, um, it is inconclusive, but at times we find that S3 is even faster than HDFS. And that could be because S3 is eventually consistent and S3 has a much bigger fleet of servers. So what we're gonna do next is to upgrade our file format to either ORC or Parquet file format, which is one of the two latest um, columnar file storage format and we will uh, benchmark that on S3 and see the results. These two file format has very different read, write, and seek characteristics, and we'll, we'll see how that goes, and being able to work well on S3 is a key um, consideration for us. So the next questions or the next uh, kind of issue that we need to deal with is S3 being eventually consistent. So by the way of convention, we mitigated a lot of the inconsistent listing behavior the two things we do is um, we do not, uh, when we run jobs, we do not overwrite into the same key space, and we also avoid writing a lot of small files. By doing that, um, we mitigate most of the inconsistent listing behavior, but we also build a library called Sampert. Um, in the past couple of months, we built that so that we could um, kind of have visibility into the problem as it happens. What it is is a library that we inject into our Hadoop clusters. Um, we wrap around all the file system calls that we're going to S3. When we create a key in S3, we put a key in DynamoDB. When we do a listing on S3, we compare it to what we see in DynamoDB. And what we found out, uh, actually, we give user a choice. When inconsistent listing happen, the user can either decide to fail or continue to drop after X minutes of retry. What we found out is that um, when we do, uh, within a day for the last month or so, um, we have about tens of inconsistent listing that happened, and after, or within 15 minutes of retry, most of them, or 70% of them are gone, and for the remaining 30%, it could take up to hours to become consistent. But the key point is, with Semper, the user have visibility and they could decide what to do when the issue happened. So the next key decision we make is that we have multiple clusters. We have an SLA cluster for prod job, ad hoc cluster for ad hoc job. They're physically isolated so that these are two different job types that we run so that they're in two different environments. And we also put them in two different zones so that they are, uh, they are more fault tolerant. We also spin up bonus clusters in three different zones during 12 hours of Netflix traffic in the US. So the trough time is during nighttime in the US. At that time, we have a lot of excess capacity across the zones because we do reserve capacity. So the ASGs for our um, Netflix site traffic would shrink down. We would leverage these excess capacity spin up EMR clusters and run ETL and data analytics jobs so that um, we could get the data by the morning. The third thing we do um, is that we have a unified and global data pipelines. The two main pipelines, there's events pipeline and dimension pipelines. They're both uh, Hadoop-based pipeline in some fashion. The event pipelines uh, span across all the Netflix services and span across all the device types we have. And we also have one unified semi-format um, data format for all, across all the data sources, and we have over 100 data sources. For the dimension pipeline, it's called Agathus. 
Um, we have tens of them running. It does bulk extraction from our Cassandra online data store. Um, what it does is basically restore the SS tables, run Hadoop jobs on top, and convert them into Hive dimension tables. So with these two unified pipelines, for an engineer to add in data source, it becomes a lot easier. And Genie is something that I'll mention in the next slide. So last but not least, we innovate on top of the Hadoop layers to build services and tools so that our team can scale better, so that our system can become a lot more self-serve. So on top of Hadoop layer, we have three services that we built. Uh, Genie is an abstraction layer on top of Hadoop. Um, a user could actually issue a Hive pick or Hadoop job by doing a REST API call. And Genie is going to decide which clusters to run it on based on tags and based on statuses of the cluster, which means Hadoop administrators can actually pull a particular Hadoop cluster out of the fleet, or we could do red black pushes to upgrade our Hadoop cluster without impacting the users. Franklin is a, a metadata service that we are currently building. The goal of it is to become a data catalog across all the data sources that we have, including Hive, Pick, RDS, S3 files that are just landed on S3, um, Teradata, and Redshift. Event service is an orchestration layer that is used to kick off ETL job flows when certain event or conditions is satisfied. So we also manage a couple of CLI gateways for the users to run ad hoc queries and to access the ad hoc cluster specifically. On top of these services, we build tools. Lipstick is a, pig, um, is a, is a uh, graphical representation of pig workflow that shows users' job information as it executes. Sting is a visualization and reporting tool that we built on top of a system that um, run a set of scheduled Hive jobs based on user specification. Forklift is a data movement tool that moves data between S3 and Teradata. For example, we have data that we want to download from S3 into Teradata for reporting using MicroStrategy. Um, Looper is a ETL backfield tool that we run ETL backfield jobs. ETL developer would probably want to run ETL backfield job for the past X weeks or X number of days, and it would run the job in higher parallelism to get it done. Sherlock and Viso are data analytics tools that we built on top to, to let us um, look at Hadoop metrics within a cluster. So specifically, Sherlock allows us to look at aggregated Hadoop metrics um, within a cluster. For example, the number of S3 bytes read for day in total. And Inviso basically allow us to discover a specific job based on tags, based on attributes, and dive deep into that specific Hadoop job and see how it ran. So it's worthwhile to mention that both Genie and Lipsticks are Netflix open source project. Our goal is to open source the components that we build so that we could be more scalable and leverage the open source communities. So putting all into perspective, this is the current scale of um, our system. As we more, add more subscribers and viewing hours, um, the amount of data and footprint of the clusters will continue to increase. So I'm going to run through some of the use cases of how we use our system. It's obvious that we allow users to add, access our ad hoc cluster to do ad hoc jobs um, for data exploration, or maybe they want to do some testing of their ETL jobs. Like I mentioned, we have simple reporting tool built on top of our system, and this is just a screenshot of Sting, which is a uh, simple visualization and reporting tool that is based on a set of Hive jobs that users specified. And we also run a lot of ETL jobs on our system. PIG is our ETL language of choice. We already migrated most of our ETL jobs um, from the data center to the cloud, and we are building a lot more on it. And I'm going to run through a few of the ETL um, use cases as well. So we use our system to build and train analytics and statistical models. And with this model, and combining with hundreds of signals that we gather from the site, we do scoring. Um, the scoring results would tell us um, what recommendations we should give to each user, um, what are the search results we should service based on the search terms, and for example, the predicted lifetime value of new users for marketing purposes. These are just a few examples. And scoring can be done on the Hadoop clusters or the system that we build, or sometimes data scientists has their own R cluster to run it. 
A-B testing. So we run um, up to 100 test cases on our site at any given time, and each of them has a number of test cells. Um, and all these test cells and test cases, we measure them based on a set of standard metrics and against a set of standard dimensions. So for example, we will be running a lot of user experience related A-B tests on our site. Um, a common metric that we always look at is play duration. And we will look at it against uh, dimension like um, user segmentation, the, the geolocation, um, device types, things like that. So what we do is we have regular, uh, we have jobs running in, in our system regularly to calculate all these metrics. And an internal team, a vertical team that actually built a tool called Ignite that actually pull these data from our system and actually display them for our product managers and en engineers to um, actually compare the results and it's a pretty interactive UI. So Open Connect is uh, Netflix CDN solutions. We provide to our, um, uh, to, to ISP providers who participate in this program a uh, storage appliance that cache the uh, popular movies and TV shows. Um, in order for them to save transit cost. So we have jobs in our system to determine what are the most popular movies and TV shows based on different locations, and we use that results to um, populate the cache for these appliances. So I guess I'm gonna summarize by saying what, what makes EMR scale for us. It allows us to build a very scalable platform on top, and it allows our team to be a lot more agile in the process of doing so. Um, EMR does all the heavy lifting of integrating Hadoop on EMR, um, on EC2 and AWS. Specifically, they have a Ruby client that allow us to spin up clusters on different node types so that, so that we can do experiment and do benchmark a lot easier. Um, they have expand shrink, S3 integration, and CloudWatch. These are the features that we leverage. Um, so it let us focus on innovation and build a, a more robust platform and solution. And also we work very closely with the EMR team for technical issues when it happens. And we also have a very collaborative relationship with them to discuss strategic roadmap items. Um, so to bring our um, infrastructure to the next level. So these are the up and coming um, EMR enhancements, hopefully that we could leverage, and these are the outcome of some of the collaborative discussions we have with EMR team, and I'm just picking out a few to show here. Um, heterogeneous node cluster is important to us because that way, if we have multiple different node type in a cluster, it would allow us more effectively leverage um, excess capacity um, during 12 hours. Auto expansion, so we currently use expansion already. We, expand our SLA cluster when we need to do catch up on ETL jobs and shrink them back. But auto expansion could allow the cluster to automatically expand and shrink based on load and based on rules that we specify that would be ideal. And ritual monitoring infrastructure, something like cluster heat map or um, being able to identify any problematic nodes on the cluster would actually help us administer, administer the cluster a lot easier. So finally, what we're trying to do is strive to build the best of class big data platform in the cloud, and we want to be the reference architecture of the industry by open sourcing some of the components that we built. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. It's exciting to see our customers building interesting technologies on top of EMR and open sourcing them. And Netflix definitely is leading the way there, open sourcing um, Genie and Lipstick. Uh, we also have another customer, Yelp, who is actually going to present tomorrow. If you guys are around, you should check it out. Um, they have a MR job library that they've open sourced, which is essentially Python on top of EMR. Really exciting, um, exciting uh, tool as well. So now I'd like to invite Bob Harris, who is uh, uh, going to talk about how, um, of Channel 4, who is going to talk about how they use EMR in conjunction with the infrastructure they already have in the enterprise uh, case. So. Thank you, Peter. Hi. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, and thanks for this opportunity to come and tell you about uh, what we're doing on EMR at uh, Channel 4. Now, unlike 
Netflix, I guess I ought to tell you a little bit about who Channel 4 are first, because unless you're from the UK, you, you've probably not heard, for, heard of us. We are a public service, commercially funded, not-for-profit broadcaster. And let's just get it out of the way straight away. We're not the BBC. Everybody knows the BBC. We are the other public service broadcaster. We have a remit to innovate when it comes to content. And I like to think as CTO that we also innovate when it comes to leverage and technology. We are funded predominantly by advertising with a turnover today of probably about $1.6 billion. Um, and all the profit is effectively folded back into, into making more content. So we're a company that is very, very, very mindful of what things cost. And that's really why we're, we're sitting uh, using sort of AWS and, and EMR today. And finally, our content sits across a portfolio of about a dozen channels and more importantly, across about 30 or so video on demand platforms similar to Netflix uh, and across uh, a multitude of devices today. And it's really the data that comes back off those platforms that drove us towards uh, needing to do uh, the analytics we do today. But what really started it all off was back in 2010, we got a new CEO. And the first thing David announced was Channel 4 was going to become a data-driven company. So sitting somewhere down in the basement, I thought, this is, this is going to be interesting. What does becoming a data-driven company mean? Well, obviously, it goes without saying, we're going to be analyzing a lot more data than we were at the time. And I sat about thinking, what is it, what is it going to mean to process you know, one, two, three orders of magnitude more data than we were, than we were already processing? especially when the processing platform we were using was based on these sorts of technologies. Now, I guess many of you in the room, we've certainly all heard of these technologies. Some of you will actually be, be running them. I mean, this is a well-established business intelligence capability we had in Channel 4 based on proprietary products. Uh, we led, the, certainly in the uh, advertising industry with things like real-time data processing, back at the turn of the century, three real-time data warehousing. So we're pretty used to doing reporting at large scale. We're pretty used to doing it, doing it near real time. Good skills in that team. But realistically, you know, two major issues for, for me as CTO. Scaling that platform by an order of magnitude was going to cost more money than I could even begin to think about throwing at it. And also, you know, one of the first things our new CEO did was put a new analytics team in place. As I said, we've been doing reporting for a long time, but now we were going to have to sort of support analytics. And when I thought about that, it really came to me that reporting is all about sort of rear view mirror. It's what's happened. Analytics feels like sort of head up display looking forward. These were going to be very different individuals and have very different requirements. So income Hadoop or in income Hadoop. We'd, we'd actually realized we were going to see this data explosion coming down the road, you know, some time ago. Uh, and order, already started experimenting with, with open source Hadoop. And we'd actually run an in-house uh, trial. Uh, we ran that in-house trial on about a cluster of about 10 Dell machines. And over a period of about two weeks, we, you know, we used one of, the, one of the common distros out there. Over a two-week period, we spent more time trying to make the tin work trying to make the interconnects work, trying to get the JVM sorted out than we ever did running any Hive. What it did, sorry, running any, any, any Hadoop, what it did tell us, this was definitely the right technology, but this really didn't feel like an easy way to be going about it. We're a very small team. We're talking about, you know, single digit technicians, not 20, 30, 40, 50 or whatever. Uh, and I think it was in 2011, around October, I stopped by Seattle, because we've been using Amazon since 2008, so we were a relatively early adopter of the platform from a compute point of view, and I saw Peter in Seattle, and I think it was 2011, October, and he ridiculed me for ever having put this stuff on real tin, and said, you've got to go away and, and, and drive EMR, test drive EMR, which we did. We actually achieved more in two days test driving EMR than we had in the sort of previous months doing it on real tin. So we flipped across pretty quickly to, to running our new work on EMR. Um, ran a lot of it in parallel with the conventional BI. You've got to understand, you've got to 
big investment in BI, you've got a set of skills, you've got a set of people that understand those tools. There's a bit of a learning curve with this stuff and it's, it's very, very different from perhaps if you're used to writing reports in things like business objects. Uh, but we took a big step in 2012 and we put it straight into the hands of the end users. So we, we bypassed, as it were, all the teams, all the report, report writing teams, and we gave Hive to the, end, to the end users, to the analysts. And in the same way Netflix has, we've had to develop a whole set of tools to allow them to do that. We've got something called the Big Data Control Panel. We're not marketeers, we don't come up with sexy names for things, but the Big Data Control Panel is basically a Django app that, that allows the analysts to stop start clusters, stop clusters, submit um, Hive queries, etc., get results back, and if they remember when they go home at night, shut the clusters down again. That's become a bit of an issue, and we have to go and kill them every evening. Uh, that's a tool that we do think occasionally about open sourcing, and when I, when I see Netflix present and show all their, open, all their different open source tools, I do feel a little bit guilty, so maybe we'll get round to, round to that one day. Uh, and later, later in 2012, we basically put all those EMR workflows into production. So now Channel 4 as a business is relying on EMR to run, to run the business every day. Uh, real, realistically, it just grows and grows now. And more recently, we've been starting to use things like Mahout and R and HBase, etc. So pretty much the standard roadmap that this, this takes you on. Once you start using this, it just becomes so compelling, it, uh, it just, just grows. So... You know, why are we doing this? What sorts of problems are we solving? Well, largely, uh, it's all about giving, exactly the same with Netflix, it's all about giving our end users, our viewers, a better experience. As I said, they currently consume our content across a range of services, a range of devices, and the first thing we want to do is try and give them a joined up experience. So we want to we recognize that person on whatever platform they, they, they turn up on. As I said, it might be a digital TV set, it might be increasingly a connected TV set, but more often now it's on an iPad, a tablet, an iPhone, an Android phone, uh, wherever they happen to be. So I suddenly realize these are two points that are on my round. You know, so what data are we using? Uh, largely web, web, uh, website clickstream logs. Uh, these currently come to us via typical log collection platforms. One of the issues I've still got, and we'll talk about it in a little while, is I don't often get those logs for 24 hours, you know, until 24 hours after the event. But a huge volume of, of clickstream logs coming in. Increasingly, 4, 4OD, I should explain, 4 on demand is our video on demand platform. Uh, a lot of video on demand activity data coming in. We've got over 9 million registered users. That's a... Uh, Mm, something around 18% of the UK population, I think, registered. And a huge number of the views, something around 60% today. So a huge number of the interactions on my platform are people who are logged in. So it means I recognize who they are. We don't enforce that. The majority of, you know, being a public service broadcaster, free-to-air broadcaster, our ethos is very much, we're not going to force you to, to tell us who you are. But if you do tell us who you are, we will strive to give you a better experience. In terms of general, general reach, I think something like 53 million people a month, 53 million individuals a month consume some bit of Channel 4 content during that month. So that's something like 92% of the UK population. Ah, go back again. And the principal tasks, largely audience segmentation, uh, allows us to feed uh, better adverts uh, we, we really want you to enjoy those adverts, so we try and feed you ones that are relevant. Uh, Personalise the experience when you arrive at our, at our site. It's really nice if we recognise who you are. Welcome back, whoever. And increasingly, recommendations. Today, something like 10% of our views, we think, come, come from recommendations. And holding you and making you view more and more and more content, obviously desperately important to us. Um, again, we've put a pipeline together. I'm not going to go through every detail of this, and apologies, it's, it's not really meant to be readable. It's just really meant to show this sort of left to right flow we go through. Uh, most of this uh, content is generated on, on um, web platforms. So this data lives in the web already. 
so the first thing we do with it, we put it straight into S3. Put it into S3 for a couple of reasons. One is I can put it into S3 at very low cost. I still get analysts come and tell me, so by that I mean external analysts, that storing data is very expensive and you have to really be careful about what it is you collect. Rubbish. It's really cheap. Collect anything that moves, put it into S3. If you're not going to use it straight away, put it into Glacier. I won't say which company told me that, but they are, no, no it wouldn't be fair to say who. Um, the other reason we put it into S3, as you heard earlier, when it's in S3, I can run multiple clusters off it. And as I've said, we've already let the users, the users loose on running their own clusters. Then we effectively put that through a left to right, all written in Pig. I'm certainly going to be taking a look at Lipstick. Pig is a language I, I happen to love, actually. But uh, all written in Pig, Python, Java, but a lot of Pig. And we put it through, and we basically process and, and you know, add to the quality of that data as we go through. We dedupe it. We, we improve the quality of it. We add flags to it to, 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 to assist with the analysis, et cetera. Um, certainly, a lot of work we've done there is, is using things like Elasticash and, Re and Redis on our mapper nodes, et cetera, to improve the performance and allow us to uh, do things like work out dwell times between two different transactions, et cetera. How long were you watching a piece of video for? Did you watch this piece of video for longer than you watched the last piece of video? That sort of thing. And finally, out of that pipeline as we go along, various points spit the data out to the, to the end users. Uh, again, not meant to see this, but that sort of orangey section on the right-hand side there of that diagram, that's the chunk that we do in, in EMR. And it's, we've already used the term ETL here a few times today, and I always talk about you know, EMR as being ETL on steroids. Uh, we process billions of rows in a typical run, sometimes anything up to 20 billion rows. What comes out the end are a few million rows of results, and those million rows of results we put into an RDBMS, usually into our Oracle database. That means it's immediately available to all those folks writing reports who are used to those tools, etc. Um, but the point I really like to make is this stuff is totally complementary with what you've already got. People come to me and say, you know, I can't use EMR, I can't use Hadoop because we've already got this sunk investment in, pick the, you know, t technology of, you know, of your choice, Oracle, Teradata, whatever. Uh, that's, that's, that's incorrect. You, you absolutely can. These things are totally complementary. There is no need to rip and re replace that existing technology. I'm not saying I'm going to buy any more of that existing technology, but you don't need to throw it away. Uh, and going forward, EMR will continue to underpin all, all our growth, etc. So very quickly, because I'm out of time, uh, use of EMR is just going to grow in Channel 4, and I'm really excited by some of those new, new, new announcements coming along. We've got to get ourselves migrated to, to Hadoop 2, um, certainly for just so we can get access to things like Yarn. Redshift is a no-brainer to, be, to begin to replace some of that traditional data warehousing as we go forward. Again, we don't have to rip it out, but as it ages out, we'll move things towards Redshift. Uh, we're putting in things like Direct Connect, so it means I can actually plumb data between my on-prem and my VPC-based you know, cloud systems. And the thing that I was most excited about this morning, because we've been doing a lot of work around real-time analysis, I don't want to base my segmentation on what you did last time you came to see me. I want to base my segmentation on what you're doing today. Because may, may, you know, maybe last time you were in a bad mood and you were looking for drama, but today you want comedy. If I can actually do in-session analytics, when you press the play button, I've got 23 minutes on average to come back and make another recommendation to you. That's a lifetime if I could get the data. As I said, it takes 24 hours to arrive today. Using Kinesis, um, you know, we've been playing with things like Storm, Kafka, and things like that. Kinesis, for me, was the most exciting thing of this, uh, of this conference. And to hear, as I've just tweeted, there is going to be a Kinesis to email connector, um, that is going to be, be tremendously useful for us. So that's what we do. Thank you very much.